Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the new followers, to the people who are joining today for the first time. So this is portfolio management during crisis number nine. Uh, we started in, in March um, and I've been trying to help you guys navigating these markets as much as I can. And hopefully today is going to bring a bit more of help to some of you. Uh, just quickly, my background uh, for some of you who are uh, attending for the first time. I've been trading since 2000. Uh, I started in 2000 in Paris. Then I moved working for hedge fund in 2004, between 2004 and 2008. From 2009 to 2018, I worked as a prop trader here in London. And uh, I've done as well uh, some mentoring since 2014 for another company from 2014 to 2017. And as well, I started in 2018 my own mentoring program and my own video series uh, in 2019. So today, what are we going to cover? Um, so situation across asset classes, as usual, we're going to be uh, doing some technical and looking at price action. Again, sorry to bother, but we're going to be looking at central banks. We're going to be doing a bit of macro, looking at the flash PMIs. Uh, we're going to be looking as well at the IMF report that came out yesterday. Uh, a bit of bank uh, stress test. Uh, so there is a bank stress test coming in the next uh, 30 minutes in the US. A bit of trading psychology because I know that some of you might be struggling. And I think you know, this is something that we need to do over and over and looking at the odd performance that again we covered and we're going to be finishing with the short sellers and what has been happening with the case of uh, Wirecard. So uh, last week uh, we had last Friday we had the expiry uh, on, on so the quadruple reaching which in reality is a triple reaching so expiry last Friday um, and very often what you have is you have um, a, a change of condition a couple of days or you know, the week after. Uh, and that started on Tuesday, where we had the sell-off, uh, felt really much like a new positioning in terms of hedging, uh, both Delta, Gamma, whatever you call it. Um, again, we have done it over and over, looking at uh, options and how the, the option markets are important in the, in, in, in the overall market. Um, quickly, that I'm not gonna be covering, something that I'm not gonna be covering uh, today, you should be looking on YouTube at uh, something that we cover in March, which is the uh, rebalancing uh, for the end of the quarter and the end of the month. So at the end of the quarter, you have the mutual funds, uh, the 6040, uh, that have to uh, rebalance their portfolio. And here this is interesting because if you look at the S&P since the, uh, uh, the end of last March, uh, the market was at 2300 something maybe a bit more, uh, but literally the market rallied 20% uh, since the uh, over the quarter, meaning that we might see a, a natural flow of, of, of stocks um, sellers uh, coming into into year, into sorry quarter end. And very often they started this um, at um, two to uh, two to five days, literally five five trading days uh, before uh, the end of the quarter. Okay, um, so quickly, just before going into the technical analysis, I would like to discuss the U.S. sectors and how those U.S. sectors have been doing since we last spoke. Uh, so the the last five days, last month, last three months. Again, you can do one year, five years, depending on your time frame. But as the market is moving a lot, I think this is key to understand uh, where. Uh, is the, the noise and where is the uh, really things moving. Um, and as you can see, let's try to do pure PowerPoint and pen here. So if you look at energy, energy really suffered over the last five days. Um, then when we're gonna be jumping into technical analysis, the, the, the biggest reason is WTI is struggling to move above the 40 uh, level. Um, industrial as well has been struggling, financials, um, so industrial, we're going to see as well versus the SPY, and I think this is a chart that is really telling. Uh, on the positive side, we always get the telco, the, uh, the IT, sorry, uh, which have been leading the market over and over. So the winners are still winning, 
Um, and, and as we can see, uh, uh, they are strong year to date, five days, month, three months. Um, uh, the telco have been doing okay on, on, on a weekly basis and, and actually uh, even on, on a monthly and three months. So let's jump into uh, the, the quickly on the price action. Um, so on the S&P, S&P 500, uh, which uh, is trading, you know, it's, it's closed. The future is now at uh, 3078. Um, so we still got here this um, this island reversal, meaning you get a gap up, then a gap down. So nothing is is closed. Um, normally, that that can be seen as a as a reversal uh, pattern. Having said that, um, something like the XLK, which had the same pattern, has been completely covered. We can see the, uh, uh, the, the technical is here telling you that the market is struggling to go much higher and the candles are, are pretty weak. Uh, so there are some, some topish candles. So if we look at, uh, uh, at the, the, the NASDAQ making new highs, uh, so far, so good. No problem in, 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 that, um, in that part of the market. Uh, the Russell, versus the S&P, uh, the Russell is still very weak. So again, something that we discussed. Small and mid caps have been underperforming massively, um, uh, the big caps. Um, and I think um, really, if you look at the market breadth, there is, the market is really dri driven by, by a few names. Um, the VIX, uh, so we get the spike um, that um, the really we went from 24% from and 40%. To 40 percent now it's it, it's coming down a, a bit still this is very elevated levels uh versus history um this is something that i'm struggling with um, i don't know what to think with it um i understand about the, the different drivers of these high vix uh but the market really doesn't feel like the vix should be at this level so i don't know i'm not smart enough as i said before how to understand that but that that is a struggle um credit quickly 10 versus the two um, trading really at the same level uh, for uh, for the last three months. Um, the other part of the, of the market, you know, high yield are still struggling to make uh, to, to go much higher. Um, emerging market are doing okay, um, so they are not on, on the tier, but they are they are quite quite okayish. Um, if we look at um, um, again. Um, Oil, so oil has been struggling around the 40 level. Uh, so there's a lot of supply coming from, from, from industrials, from, from real sellers, uh, from hedging at 40. And this is hard to go higher at the moment. Uh, plus, again, we, we discussed that from March onwards. There is so much stocks uh, that have been built in, in, in the US and worldwide that naturally there is this flow coming every single month. That, that, that makes, even if the supply is lower, uh, as the demand is at 90 million, this is still a struggle. Um, let's go back at go down. I think the chart that is interesting and probably all of you have seen it now is, is the gold. Uh, the gold is really testing the 1780, 1800 level. Um, it's testing, testing, testing. Um, it feels like, um, it feels like it could go now. Um, it's I mean, again, I, I'm not a, a gold uh, addict, but here it feels like really that, that there's a strong momentum. Uh, the flow is there. Um, so we'll see, as always, when there is so much positioning, uh, there is a risk of, you know, shaking the market and shaking the weak hands. Um, but, you know, uh, if you want to believe in risk on, risk off, or everything is do good, doing fine. If you think at the day like Tuesday, everything was going up so there was a risk on market and and even uh, a gold was te testing the, uh, the 1780. the currencies i mean the currencies i mean euro dollar um has been again trading sideways um dollar again was i think it was moving on, on tuesday uh, tuesday started to move uh, so there has been some some weakening on, on the dollar yen. this is something to to monitor uh the Aussie, Again, we restate, we tested this this 70 uh, level again. Um, that's going to be interesting to see. It's, so far, we have been consolidating. We'll see if we're going to go higher. Um, again, it's it's it feels like many markets are are, 
after a big move are now uh, consolidating. On some of the negatives, um, something that I'm watching, it's still the HSBC, which is a pure dog, uh, 384 uh, in London, um, making new lows, um, close to new lows. It's not bouncing. If you, if you want to believe that banks um, could be uh, uh, driving the market at one stage, uh, those are the ones to monitor. Uh, JP Morgan, I think, again, we're going to have the, test, the, the stress test tonight. Um, there's going to be a lot of catalysts uh, coming into the next two weeks for, for the sector, uh, two to three weeks, the, the stress test, um, and we're going to have the earnings soon coming. Um, and then you have the names like Amazon, Netflix, all those names that have been on the tier. Um, again, something that we're going to be discussing. Uh, but Monday and Tuesday was just amazing for, 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 the, uh, for the tech names, uh, for those 10% of, of, of this day. Um, and then we get some of the things that I'm, I'm watching, like the bank, um, how the, the um, and obviously you get the wire card as well. Uh, let's go back into this PowerPoint. And after the US sectors, if it works, yes. Uh, again, central banks, again, this is something that I update every two weeks now uh, for this presentation. Uh, so that's the Fed balance sheet on the left-hand side. And on the right hand side, this is the, this is the, the euro, uh, the ECB is one. Uh, as you can see, there has been, uh, maybe it's not that clear on, on the left hand side, but there has been a small contraction on the Fed balance sheet uh, that is mainly explained by um, some FX swaps uh, maturing. Remember, in March, the Fed um, opened 50, million, 50 billion times, times eight or 10. Um, to different central banks uh, just to, um, to open, uh, to make sure that there was enough dollar in the system. Um, and, uh, and this is, uh, uh, there, are, there, are, there were three months uh, uh, FX swaps th that matured and they were not rolled. Uh, and this is why uh, the, the, the balance sheet has been reduced. And it, it, as you're going to be seeing in the next slide, uh, it went, the central bank liquidity swaps went from 444 billion to 350 billion. So for those of you who are interested, you know, you can be looking uh, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, Fred and Fed uh, website. Um, and as you can see, the last time we had such uh, stress in the system was in 2009. It was not to the same extent, but really the Fed had to jump massively. So if, if you want, for those of you who are trading FX, um, I mean, this is clearly a sign that there is less demand for the dollar. We had really a big stress uh, in, in March, April, meaning that there was a lot of demand for dollar, which has been coming down because the Fed supplied a lot. And this is why as well, we have seen recently, one of the reasons we have seen recently a weakness in the dollar. Um, but, uh, Check those ones um, again, um, and I think uh, putting your name on the uh, mailing of the Fed and the New York Fed is really helpful because you're going to have the news uh, live, and there is every day something that is coming. Um, so uh, there was this uh, Bank of America fiscal and monetary policy tracker, which I think is interesting, um, and and which is uh, uh, sorted by a percentage to GDP, which is uh, uh, here. Um, and, and that is quite interesting to see that uh, <laughs> the US actually are uh, not close of, of top of the board, but very, very, very close. Okay. And you can see the number of uh, uh, things that the, uh, 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 the DCB, the Fed, and, uh, and the Treasury have been doing. It represents 30% of the US GDP. So the US GDP roughly is 20 trillion, okay? Uh, and that gives you 30% of 20, gives you six. Uh, so you get an injection of six trillion so far. This is just huge, huge, huge. Um, and that, um, I mean, for, 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 for me sitting in Europe, um, that tells me that um, there has been a big change <laughs> in the way uh, capitalism is done in, in the US over the last uh, three months. Um, 
so but what you have is you know you can see from 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 the bottom to the top we go from between 16 percent to 50 percent so there is huge uh, money coming into the system which has been a struggle for any market participants to understand the impact of those um, liquidities uh, going into the system so here again another picture which is at the end versus 2020 uh, uh, year end forecast which is the balance sheet as the percentage of the gdp again this is bank of america if you want to look uh, i mean on my youtube channel there is um seven minutes um uh, quick video where i explained a couple of months ago what was going on and and what was the way to move forward if you think of uh, some market participants are fairly are saying you know the benchmark of craziness is bank of japan so the bank of japan now at the moment uh, has roughly 100 percent uh, plus debt to uh, a balance sheet of uh, as a percentage of gdp uh, so that tells you even if the us were going you know from 40 to 60 uh, so that gives you from 40 to 100 that gives you 60 percent so that gives you another 12 trillion to go for uh, for the uh, for the fed so clearly uh, when the central bank bankers are telling you that uh, telling us that there is no limit um, that tells really they get still a lot of ammunition so this is the chart uh, uh, again you can see here spiking spiking but actually for the us it's spiking even more than europe okay uh, so uh, the fed has been much more active than the ecb over the last three months um so let's jump into the flash pmis so it was a couple of days we had the flash pmis so the flash pmis are coming a week before or 10 days before uh, the pmis for market um, and normally they, they are, if you have a, something like 90% uh, of the correlation with um, uh, the, the ISM at the end. Um, so it has been bouncing nicely from very low level. I think what people are really don't understand is how the market uh, PMIs, ISM, all those things are, 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 um, are, are done. Uh, this is a month-on-month -month survey okay so as this is a month-on-month -month survey if you want to believe that this is a v-shaped recovery and you only get 50 or close to 50 that means the more or less the situation is like a month ago okay whereas if you want to have a v-shaped recovery you probably need 60 70 percent of the uh, survey participants to telling us you know it's much better so what has been happening is and, and, and for the flash PMIs, the ISM, it's not working well when it is Armageddon, okay? Because people are very confused. Uh, people don't know how to answer questions. So we need to be taking all those flash PMIs with a pinch of salt, not, you know, saying the only thing that is, that is obvious and you see the headlines is we touched the floor in May. Since then, we have been bouncing, but we are not bouncing like crazy because otherwise, if you say 50, that means there are as as many uh, uh, so th this is neutral months on months um you can see the picture for for the pmi in europe there are some that were missing because they were not out uh, france is the best one uh, not only because uh, this is france but uh, the reality france do always does better in a situation like this uh, versus germany for instance because germany depends massively on exports and, and if you look at 2008-2009 uh, France for instance did, did much better than Germany so when you look at macro you should be looking at um, how the GDP um, are, are made of uh, meaning the weights uh, of the GDP this is uh, for the people who, who watch the 4 by 4 this is something that I explained between video 2 and 5 as you know, the, the, if you look at the US GDP, for instance, stands at 70% of, uh, of consumption. Uh, this is the highest in, in the world. And, and that means really what matters is the consumption. Uh, whereas if you look at Germany, this is a very different split. Um, and that tells you as well how the, the, the economies will be bouncing. As always with the flash PMIs, uh, even if it's not um, if it's not perfect, they're going to tell you and they're going to give us some indication. And here, those are some comments that um, I find interesting. Um, 
again, we know that uh, uh, by lifting the, the, the lockdown and restriction, normally we should be bouncing. Um, again, here, yeah, it's not me, it's not even me. Uh, France has even staged a tentative return to growth. So there are some, some, some positive. Um, but again, here, this is the warning. The warning comes if you have some cluster, if you have some slowdown. Uh, and that means everything is very, is very, let's say, uh, 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 at risk. So be careful. Uh, where do we get the flash PMI from? Uh, you go into uh, market, uh, M-A-R-K-I-T.com, and you get all of them for free um, every month. Uh, it's well explained. It's interesting to read. Um, if you want to get all the data or some of the data, you can go on investing.com. Uh, where you're going to have many uh, data that you can be uh, probably downloading, or if you can't download, that, download them, you can copy and paste a uh, huge database. Otherwise, you uh, go for the 4x4 four four video series and you're going to have a nice uh, database. Um, so from the flash PMI, I want to move into the IMF expectations um, that came yesterday. Again, uh, if you have been uh, trading, if you've been in a trading room, if you have been working for a hedge fund, you know that uh, there is always the joke of the IMF, which is the last one to change the expectation. So don't be surprised. Again, they are the last one. Um, despite having uh, many, many economists, um, they are really late to the party. And here, maybe because they got a French who is leading the show, but that's not the only reason. Uh, what is interesting here, if we look at the expectations is um, uh, if we look at the advanced economies, uh, we get minus 8% in 2020 and 4.8% in 2021. So for advanced economies, this is not going to be a V-shaped recovery. And we can be talking US, Europe, um, because if you go down from 100 by 10%, that means 90. And if you go up by 6%, that means you're up roughly to 95. So that means you're down 5% over two years. Um, but the expectations between advanced economies versus emerging market um, are, are, are pretty, um, pretty big. Um, there is huge expectations from the IMF and from many market participants now that emerging markets are gonna be doing well. Uh, so if you think minus 3% and plus 5.9%, that means mostly uh, the growth, um, the big chunk is going to be coming from, from, from emerging. Um, look, um, I'm a bit struggling with those expectations for both China and, and, and India. Um, I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see what we're going to have. I think here it's very aggressive still on emerging to think that um, this time emerging are going to be safe and not going to be suffering. I mean, I wish, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it's going to happen. Uh, we'll see how it's going to unwind, but the expectations on the lower part are pretty aggressive. So maybe there is a trade to do here because I think the market is, is really uh, taking the same assumption that you know emerging markets are going to do fine, especially again on huge expectation on China and India. I think China is really struggling because they are changing the business model. I think India actually is, is really struggling big, 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 big time. Um, and, and, and we'll see um, again, uh, what is the trade uh, to put on. Um, here, uh, expectations on the debt. Um, I mean, obviously, if, if we look at this, uh, at the slide before, which was the monetary uh, fiscal and the fiscal stimulus, uh, if you put that much money into the system, that means debt are going up, okay? Um, if you think at the level which is uh, the, the blue line or the advanced economies, we are at 120, 130%, okay? So that's gonna be, US are gonna be at 120. Um, that is a really high level. I remember five, 10, 15 days, 15 years ago, we were saying that anything that is below, above 80 to 100% was uh, unsustainable. And now we are kind of thinking, okay, what about, um, uh, what about Japan, which is at 300%? Maybe that's, again, um, that's the, um, the benchmark. Emerging market, much lower debt. I think one of the concerns is you have some countries in emerging market who have, which have um, quite decent uh, chunk of debt. And, and, and again, 
uh, if revenues are slowing and the debt is denominated in dollar, you might be uh, struggling. Um, so now I would like to move into uh, the stress test, uh, the bank stress test. Uh, normally, uh, it should be released in the next 15 minutes. Uh, five, yeah, right now, actually. Sorry. Um, where um, it's, it's done by, by the Fed every year. Uh, so here we are talking, sorry, a bank stress test in the US. Um, and what is it, why is it important? Because this is uh, a big catalyst for banks to say, and to decide on, on, on the size of the dividend and the size of the share buyback. And that will be announced from next Monday. Um, there is a new stress capital buffer, uh, which is calculated by uh, the Fed. I think what is key as well is to see what kind of assumptions that they will take uh, in, in these calculations. Uh, if we look at 2019, because I look at it, uh, so for instance, Goldman Sachs um, um, upped its dividend 50% uh, to 125. They were announcing 7 billion uh, uh, stock uh, buyback. JP Morgan announced a 20 billion uh, share buyback. Bank of America, a 31 billion sh sh share buyback. So more or less, uh, if, if you take the whole sector, you had the yield between, between the dividend and the share buyback between 5 to 10%. So you had a, a huge uh, catalyst for the sector. Now we see what the Fed is going to say and we see what they're going to be able to do. Um, but uh, um, probably that, that is, you know, I'm not sure that the Fed on one hand is, is, is going to say, we need to put a shitload of money into the system and we're going to say, okay, to all the banks, we, you can do whatever you can, in, in what you, you want to be buying back shares. So something to check, um, look at, at last year, uh, so this is the an exercise that I've, has, uh, I've done for, for tonight. Uh, so that was the 31 billion uh, share buyback announcement last year from, uh, from Bank of America. 31 billion is really, really big, obviously. Um, and, and what is interesting is, if it moves a bit, so that was last year, the chart. Um, so you see the spike here. Uh, so gap on the open after the announcement and afterwards we went a bit higher. Uh, so you can have a catalyst going into earnings, uh, catalyst or no catalyst, because if there is nothing coming um, and probably nothing is gonna happen, this is the problem. So um, really look at this sector, the, the overall sector, um, as we've seen 15 minutes ago, has been struggling, has been underperforming the overall market, uh, rightly so. Uh, because of the yield curve, because of low yields, because of the deterioration of the balance sheet, um, the economy is doing not as good as before, meaning that uh, banks could be facing uh, very quickly uh, huge losses. Okay, so now um, if you want to be looking at one of the ETF, I like uh, KBE, uh, you can as well be looking at XLE, there's another one, um, but the sector has been weak. Uh, so this is, you know, in terms of technical analysis, something like this. Um, are we going to go here? Are we going to go here? Obviously, this is the one billion uh, question. But you know, there is um, there is a really a catalyst, and 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 what is what is interesting is we are we discuss as well, and I do that very often when I do the mentoring is uh, looking at the options. Uh, and if we look at the options, um, the July option on K KBE, implied volatility is at 53%. So high implied volatility, much higher than the market. So is it based on, on obviously this catalyst, based on the economy and based on many uh, earnings coming as well. But uh, the implied volatility of the sector is much higher than the overall market. Um, and that's um, something, you know, again, I think there are trades um, to, to, uh, to put on like emerging market, the bank versus the market. Um, you decide on the direction. This is not for, for me to tell you uh, what to do. Quickly, um, I think it's, I want to be coming back into market psycholo psychology very quickly. Um, because I have many questions and frustration for, for, for some of you. Um, again, I know how hard it is. Uh, I've been working for 
20 years in the industry. I spent 10 years in a trading room, in a prop trading room, and I can tell you how hard it is. So I can understand the frustration that you have these days um, um, looking at this market. What I can tell you, I've been saying it over and over um, and talking with, with colleagues, friends, um, risk management is the hardest part of the trading okay so that was coming from one of my from from one of um, someone contacted me and said look greg you need to do to do a video on risk management because this is the hardest part of trading actually i think you know the risk management can be done quite easily uh if you follow a process okay so this is really something that i've been pushing for the four by four I think where we are really messing things up is when we think that we can be facing huge losses because we don't have a good risk management. So uh, uh, I've been saying that over and over, if you want to be working in a prop trading or a prop trading firm, if you want to be working for a hedge fund, if you want to be raising money for clients, the first thing that we people will ask you is, obviously they will ask you for the returns, but the second thing is, especially for prop trading, they will uh, ask you how uh, you've been doing the risk management. So they will be looking in depth in your risk management. If you don't have anything like a strong risk management, and I've been saying the, the word risk management 15 times, uh, you have no chance, no chance. And again, I think this is key for many of you in terms of frustration, because if you look, if you read on Twitter, if you go online, if you watch TV, even if you talk to, um, maybe some to, to your friends they're going to tell you oh they got these guys you know robin wood you know it's fine it's easy and robin wood you know it's just like um it's just uh the the, the scapegoat of, of of these days it doesn't matter you always get uh, another robin hood but um and and you know it's the same with some online gurus that are telling you oh i'm making this and this yesterday i was talking with someone um who thought about going with with someone else and said okay what is this guy i've been doing and when i said the whole story it was very surprised so the thing is trading psychology is extremely important trading real money versus paper money is important so you can be the thing is you can you want to believe that you're going to be making money looking at your uh, excel spreadsheet and looking at your uh, strategies when you're trading real money is very, 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 very different. Okay, and uh, and I can tell you that I know that uh, um, here in, in this uh, webinar there is one of my ex colleagues. Uh, um, this is uh, we have been experienced the same thing together. Um, that is really um, uh, trading real money is 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 a different game. And and I hear you about about your frustration. Back trading is easy. Um, I think you need um, to understand that frustration is almost for everyone. Okay, I was frustrated a week ago. I'm frustrated every day, and and as long as you you do have like a positive frustration, you move forward. And again, this is very cliche for me to say, but I mean this is my strongest conviction. Um, in terms of risk management, quickly uh, because I again I've done it uh, hopefully so well in the four by four. I just think when you put a position when you have an id first and when you want to put a position what is your worst case scenario okay worst case scenario means literally armageddon and armageddon could happen um, and that means how you can hedge your position versus armageddon uh, then you need to be thinking about what's your upside versus your downside and i always take the example in session four of the mentoring program, I always ask my mentees, you know, what's your upside versus your downside? And 80% of the time, despite them spending a lot of time to video through website, they will come with risk return of one to one. And I tell them, you know, what's, I mean, it, it, it's a poor risk reward. And if, you know, just uh, uh, confronting the facts, you're gonna be making a huge improvement. And uh, 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 at the bottom, negative noise is a killer. Uh, really, you get a lot of noise in this world. Um, it is it, you, it takes time to find the right people. I, I give you another example. On Tuesday, I was struggling with my trading. Um, I went against the market on a ship stock, and um, two hours after the open, and then I had a Skype call with one of my ex colleagues. Okay, and both of us we pump up our energy, and after the call. I did a trade, okay, and I did a positive trade, and, and, and I made more than one I lost. And 
you're going to have people who are going to help you and people that are going to say, you know, you're a piece of shit. You need to, you need to, you need to work on your stuff. Try to find the people that help you. And more importantly, do not force the trade. Okay. So my saying of, 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 of FOMO is do not force the trade. This is extremely important. And that can be, um, uh, if you are working in a prop trading, if you are working for hedge fund, if you are working uh, with your own money, do not force the trade. Um, now I want to be moving into the FANG uh, winner's take all. Uh, so this chart was from uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, the lovely Goldman Sachs, but that tells you about um, how uh, the market, again, I mean, I've been saying that over and over, and I'm sorry for those of you who think that I'm an old man and I should be uh, changing my broken record. Um, but literally, if you put aside uh, those five to six names, the market is down and, and it's down quite a lot, okay? Not quite a lot, but three to 8%. And you see the dispersion between those winners and those losers. If, if what I do now is I follow and, and I follow those names. So what is key for, for, for all of us is trying to find what are the drivers at any point in time in the market. The drivers in the market, we know them, those are those names plus the names that are breaking higher. And if we look, uh, uh, please, for those of you who are not there, a couple of weeks ago, we look at uh, where to identify the names that are trading big through options. Um, and if you look at the day like Tuesday and Monday, Apple was trading huge uh, calls, uh, same with Microsoft, and they were making new eyes. So if you look at Monday and Tuesday only, it outperformed the S&P by 3%. Uh, out of those five to six names. So 3%, uh, you look at the charts, it's just uh, insane. So here I've done another exercise, uh, which I've done before as well. So I got my, my US universe of stocks, which is roughly 1780, 1700, uh, 1800 stocks, um, where uh, based on, on, on two to three billion market cap and above. Um, so that was a, as of yesterday, 63% of the stocks, those stocks were trading above their 15 uh, uh, days moving average, 35% above their 200. But in the meantime, look at how those names were trading above the, move, uh, uh, the 200 moving average. 36% for Amazon, 28% for Apple, Microsoft 22, Facebook 18, Google only 8% because Google have been, has been saying that uh, the advertising business will be struggling. But that tells you how far those names are away from the mean. Okay, so if you think, if you want to believe that the long term mean is the 200, you can use 200, 250, it doesn't matter. Okay, what matters is how far away are you from this mean? So what is the possibility of the reversion to the mean? Look at a chart like Amazon. Okay, so the, the, uh, literally we are at 2000 versus 27.30 for the stock. And uh, um, that tells you here how far away the market is from those uh, big levels. So again, this is something that I discussed over and over and over. As long as this market is driven by those five to six names, there's gonna be massive dispersion. I strongly advise you to be looking at the options even now on a weekly basis, understanding you know, where the big volume, and that's gonna help you massively to be doing your filtering on, on, on the possible breakout names as well. Because if you look at Monday, Tuesday, you had probably 20, 30, 40 names that break out five to 10% or plus. Um, so I started to, to trade in 2000. And honestly, I've never, I don't want to sound too old, but I, 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 I never seen a market like this where you get dispersion and some winners that are moving like crazy, five, 10, 15%. And, and, and the thing is, the market is what it is. So, you have to respect that, but you need to understand what is ongoing. Um, and, and, and to me, um, it's, I can tell you that the internals of the market are very, very poor. The market breadth is very poor. Very few names are moving higher. It's mainly moving by options. Um, the price action is, is not that great. If you look at the S&P, 
the price action of the S&P is poor, the price action of the Russell is poor, the price action of the Nasdaq is really, really strong, but you know, this is very few names. So think about you know, the reversion to the mean, the possibility of reversion to the mean. Um, and again, against the frustration of the possible uh, uh, um, not making money, if you're not making money, because you get a risk management and you see, that's the way it is. So if, as long as you get a process and a risk management, and, and carry on with it. I, I hear your frustration for some of you, I'm pretty sure that some others, you know, um, are making good, good money, which which is great. But you know, this is you need as as well to understand what are the drivers of the market. So, um, next topic: uh, the short seller, because this <laughs> is making the headlines. So, if if I mean, at least on my Twitter, uh, um, there is probably eighty percent, which is where I count. Um, so Wirecard, uh, if you have been trading the European market, if you have been following some smart people, uh, it has been in the pipe for quite a long time. Okay, so the first thing that I want to say is, as a prop trader, I have huge respect for short sellers. Okay, so those guys are superheroes. Uh, they are extremely smart. They do their job. They, they, they understand what they are doing, uh, but, and there is a massive but, which is, if you look at this chart, you can understand that uh, patience is a virtue, but there is a struggle with uh, the risk management. So it's easy for people to say, look now, Wirecard, it was, it was a done deal. Yes, it was in the pipe for, for many, many years, okay? Um, not that many people make money, um, so if you look at this chart in February 2016, uh, there was the, the big report from Zatara report and the stock went down from 40 to 30, I can't remember. Um, and after that, we went from 31 to 170 plus, okay? And if you look at that chart again in September 2018, I remember because when you do pop trading, you look at um, um, the, the index rebalancing. And and more or less Wirecard entered the DAX at the old time. Right? And since then it came down, there has been, there was in January, 2019, another report from the FT. Uh, but what, what, what is telling you is if you go short here and it goes there in between you're dead. Okay, it's, it's, it's just like you, you, can, you can try to pretend that you are short and you're still, and you're making money here. In between, you're really, really suffering. So. Timing those short sellers' IDs are really, really hard. And I think there is uh, uh, someone called the Mark uh, Cordes, something like this on Twitter. He's a short seller, he's extremely smart. And, and, and he's clearly saying that, you know, having those timing, the risk management is the hardest part for them. Um, and it's nice to be making the headlines for them and they deserve it because they have been suffering big time, but this is, this is a tough one. So, um, and, and actually the, the, the story on Wirecard is, is very similar to uh, with uh, trading education in a sense, uh, where if you look at the chart of, of, of Wirecard, which is similar to trading education, you get people that are bullshitting the world for 10 years, and you get many educators that are just pretending where the regulator like Baffin is not doing anything, uh, where if you look at the company like Wirecard is hiding in fiscal places like um, in Asia, that's exactly the same. And Wirecard as well has been harassing uh, uh, journalists and, and, and people. So there is to me, this is quite interesting to see the similarities of this industry, of, of this company and, 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 the, and, and the industry that I'm working these days. Uh, very very uh, very strong similarities and at the main in the meantime uh, that tells me a lot um, and that gives me some hope that uh, stuff uh, could happen so on, on, on wirecard again um, I think here I'm looking at iPay um, which is the ETF sector uh, the ETF for the for the sector of fintech um, I think you need always to think about what could happen next um, 
I want, I started to believe now that uh, they might, we, we could start to see uh, um, a derating uh, in, in the fintech business and, and, and payments system because there is not enough regulation. Uh, so they need to follow the banks. I think when you get a Wirecard story, which you had recently 20 billion market cap, that means, yes, probably they had the shit management, probably they had many, many things ongoing, but still, that tells you that there are some some bad uh, uh, behavior, behavior in, in, in this industry. Um, then coming back on the short sellers um, and to to tell you again how hard it is. Um, if you if you take the, the recent example of, of GSX, okay, some of you know or don't know that GSX is is has been pushed for by. Uh, muddy waters and I think Citron to a less extent, but many uh, muddy waters. Um, and, and they were short around 30, now the stock is at 60. If people like muddy waters, which are, you know, the top class um, uh, short sellers, um, still they can be down 100% on something. Uh, so the, the risk management is, again, I'm repeating myself, I'm a broken record today, but is really 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 hard to do um so you know when i was studying wirecard you make money and then suddenly you get the squeeze because the company is announcing a share buyback or you get some bullshit from 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 germany telling you no it's it's fine because we can't have something in germany then you have to wait you know uh, uh, the audit from uh, from ENA, ey uh, to go uh, to not work for the stock to, uh, to to go down massively but in between you know the stock goes from 30 to Hundred and seventy or more. So clearly, sometimes you like the risk reward for those trades is really really hard. And one of the biggest downside, if you go and trade uh, um, short sellers' ideas, is by definition because there has been a move in the stock, implied volatility is really really high. Okay. So if you take a borrowing stock, you get more chances that the implied volatility is going to be low. If we take the example of GSX, which was uh, a screenshot for a couple of days ago, here we are looking at the put option uh, January 2022. 20, okay, so imagine that you very bearish on, on, on GSX on the on the back of of, of this uh, short seller, and you'll be buying the the further at the money uh, out of the money put the 2250 that cost you you know something like nine dollars. Okay. So your break-even, why is your break-even? Is at something like $13, okay? So yes, obviously implied volatility could go higher quickly, but that tells you that doing the risk management through stocks, as we have seen before, it can be in your face because the stock could go higher. Plus make no mistake because it's gonna be heavily shorted. The borrow, meaning borrowing the stock is gonna cost you much more than the 1%, 2%, it's gonna be expensive. And doing through options is going to cost you shitloads. So that means you can be right on the ID, like the wire card, but in between, you're going to be losing a lot of money. So what I want to say here is regarding the short sellers, because again, they are making the headlines and they deserve it. And, 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 and it, it, it happens once every two years to, to something as big as this one. If they spend that time on something, um, clearly it is worth listening. So even if you could not be or didn't want to be short Wirecard, each time I was reading a tweet over the last four or five years about someone telling me, oh, I want to be long Wirecard, I want to be long GSX, I want to be long those names. I know I'm not going to follow these guys. I remember there is a big guy who has something like 40 to 50,000 followers. He went long Wirecard, he went long uh, LK, uh, the, the coffee, LK Coffee in, in, in China. The stock started to go down and each time he was blaming those poor short sellers um, or those poor journalists. Uh, so clearly be careful on, on the wording. You have some superheroes, uh, Jim Chanos, uh, Hampton in Australia, Hefty has done a perfect job. You get the, the, the known uh, name like Muddy Waters, uh, Viceroy, Gotham City, Citron, FT, Alphaville. So for instance, you know, if you want something for free, if you want to have good education, go into FT, Alphaville, 
they got good reports, good thing to, to read. Uh, they understand the journalists are good. Um, so those are the people to follow. My downside, and here, as, as I'm talking to, 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 to traders, and all, not all of you um, have a great, a big experience, and especially as you could be struggling with risk management, timing is really, really hard. Okay, so be careful trading this. This is a niche market. Why? Because 99% of the world is a long only world. So 99% of the world want the assets you bought, which is fine. Okay. And if you do short selling, you are in the niche market because it's mostly for hedging and, and, and you don't have a, a, a huge pocket of investment, even if it's getting bigger because the world is, is full of liquidity and, and that means there is more, uh, uh, let's say, frauds than before. And um, what I find extremely interesting for looking at the short sellers is trying to understand the process and the criteria that they are using. Okay, so if you look at the, someone like John Hampton is using different uh, filtering like uh, Muddy Waters. Um, and that tells me, you know, trying to, for instance, um, looking at what the CFO, the CEO are doing, are they selling stocks? If they are selling stocks massively, that could be a red flag. Um, some other guys would be more looking at the, um, where is, um, let's say, the, um, uh, uh, looking at the balance sheet, the quality of the balance sheet, if we have receivables, if we have, um, um, so you're going to have some white flags. Again, this is a very specific research, but as well on the long end side, uh, this is uh, some of the tools that uh, you're going to be uh, using. Similar to the timing is really hard. That means the catalysts are not always easy to identify. Again, for if you take the example of of, of the headline that is Wirecard, it, take, it took a lo long time. Uh, you have people that are professional and are doing that. Um, what I like, if you are trading, what you can be doing is putting alerts on those different names because they will come with reports, they will come with some ideas. And that's helpful. Obviously, you're going to have a, a very quick price action. Um, you can be looking at the new positions. You know, if you look at all the uh, uh, regula regulators across the world, you need very often now to declare if you get a short position. Uh, you can do screening on short position. This is something everybody's doing, especially for Germany, for France, for uh, the Dutch market, because this is going to be your next. You can be doing the same in the US. Those are the kind of filtering that you can be doing and putting in place. Um, Quickly, after the short sellers, um, I would like to discuss a bit the mentoring program uh, because I know that uh, some of you have been struggling. Um, as you know, some of you have a bit of experience trading. Uh, so the mentoring program is done for people who have done the 4 by 4 video series or have enough existing knowledge. Okay, so I do a call, a Skype call, 30 minutes to one hour to see if there is a match. Uh, the mentoring program works very, very well. Um, this is a 12 sessions over three to five months where I try to help you building your infrastructure uh, and really making the different steps um, that have uh, making the process quantitative, qualitative, price action, technical analysis, and risk management. And we try as much as possible. Uh, obviously, there is a time constraint, but to do the portfolio management and the active trading. It's going to be across asset classes, time frames, and regions. And uh, hopefully, it is about you know generating consistent flow of ideas. Uh, if I look since I, I, I started to do the mentoring, so I started to do the mentoring in 2014. Uh, I look at it this week. Uh, I've been I mentored 70 plus people. Okay, uh, and actually, 70% <laughs> of those 70 where in the last couple of years, which makes me uh, believe that it was a really, really good idea to launch this mentoring program. Um, again, that works well. I'm happy to answer some of your questions or, or your questions. Uh, it, it's better if it's with the four by four, because I know your knowledge. If you don't have done the four by four, we can discuss and see what could be needed. Um, should we do uh, a quick, um, Q&A session. Um, 
Okay, uh, I'm just boring it, but um, let's do some. What percentage of your own trades are in options, Mr. Dupont? Uh, so in terms of, uh, of options, what do I have these days? Uh, I do have a bit of ETF. I do have like, um, so when are we started to trade actually, actually uh, at, the, at, at the end of January, I put many options position. Okay, because implied volatility was at 15%, so it was a no-brainer. Now it's a bit harder. And, and what I like is when I start to have some p and um, I put a bit of my p and into out of the money stocks, uh, you, you, meaning the odd liars. Um, at the moment, I have two or three position through stocks or ETF, and I have three to five with options, okay? But you need to think in terms of nominal, uh, the nominal is, is, is smaller first with options uh, because it's gonna be, uh, hopefully it's gonna be uh, kicking in if it moves. Um, using the four by four course, would you say it, it's easy to generate ideas compared to using the ISM and NMI alone in isolation? Look, again, if you've been, if you have, uh, be looking at the ISM and the NMI over the last two to three months, you have a bit of understanding of what are the, um, um, the sectors that are trending or not trending. But the reality, I can tell you that you're really, really struggling to generate any trades, okay, or, or good trades. Um, so ISM, NMI, they don't work that much when you are in complete dislocation, where you are at the end, uh, where like it's like 2008, 2009. It's, it's a bit of a struggle. I really like to believe that the biggest beauty of the, the, uh, the ISM is the NAICS story. Okay, so you take the uh, ISM and then you scroll down and you find the names. Okay, so that is, that is a pure beauty. And this is really good to generate ID and, 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 but if you ask me, if you don't have a bottom up, if you don't have active trading, if you don't have special situation, these days you're not making much money. Okay. And I think you need to have a bit of everything. Um, what else do we have? When you have trades on, do you restrict to 20 to 60 day time, time frame? I don't have any restriction, okay? So my philosophy over the years is, I've been trading all time frames. So I literally have done one minute to two to three years, okay? Um, I've done, when I started, I was literally doing 30 seconds, one minute, one, one day, two days, three days, and then I get longer and longer. When I work for hedge fund, you know, you need to be longer and doing as well some, some active trading. When you work for prop trading, you do between one minute and one to two months okay so this is the whole time frame my philosophy is you don't want to get stuck okay so if you trade your own money if you trade for hedge fund if you tr trade for pop trading and if you come and say oh my always going to be 20 to 60 days i mean it doesn't make sense when the vix is at 15 percent and when it goes to 50 that means you have to change your time frame when you look at the special situation your special situation if that's let's say a uh, 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 what you do 20 to 60 days now when you have weekly expiry, which are the biggest drivers of the market. Okay, so that means you can't be trading. Uh, how China is changing its business model? Um, I mean, so, so, so looking at China, um, when was that? At October, October, November, 2018, the Politburo, um, when they all sat together and clearly what they said is, we're gonna be moving the business model from exports to internal demand, okay? And we know that this transition coming from massively exporting to relying more on internal demand is gonna take some time. It, you, you can't be feeding and, and making 1.5 billion people happy overnight, okay? It's gonna take time and there's gonna be transition, but this is the way that they want to move forward. Okay? Uh, uh, and there's gonna be some, some hiccups, there's gonna be some bumps, especially with China. Okay, um, is the rebalance at end of every quarter? Yes, so end, end of every quarter, March, uh, June, September and, and, and December, um, you can have a spreadsheet 
you can be building this project is looking at again how the SNP you take the SNP as a benchmark how the SNP has been uh, doing on a quarterly basis okay so here we're going to have a 20 percent move on the SNP and how uh, uh, credit has been doing on a quarterly basis so you can be using some ETF for instance uh, uh, for, for bonds and and again this is about rebalancing the 60 40 percent based on the mandate should be more or less the same coming from one quarter to another um, uh, I'm looking to buy the four bar four so that's a good news does it deal with psychology in trading such as emotion and discipline isn't it hard to know when to know when to take profits or not? Um, look, I want to believe that you know the whole process is based on on, on clear and decent expectations. Okay, um, and I think that helps massively for the emotions and the discipline. Where is the struggle? Is when people is telling you, "Oh, you need we, we want to be making ten percent and." Two, set of, two sentences later, they say, oh, we are making 50 to 100%. They, there is no match, okay? So emotions and discipline, um, it's, you, you have to deal with them, okay? Uh, it's really something that, if you think that there is no emotion in trading, it's gonna come back at you big time at one stage, okay? Um, and um, how to deal with it, you know, using, um, as I'm saying in the four by four, I've been saying before during webinars, if you are using something like putting your trades, understanding why you're making money, the big downside as a trader is you you overthink. So when you put a position of 100, you think, oh, I'm going to be losing 150, whereas you can't. The max you the max you can be losing is is 100. Okay, but even there are very little chances that unless you <laughs> unless you're long wire card, you're going to be losing 100. Okay. How do you work out a price uh, target for your stock? Um, so you look at fundamentals, okay? So you do quantitative, qualitative. You look at the stock, you look at the valuation, and then you look at the price action technical analysis and you say, okay, based on, you always need a catalyst somewhere, okay? And you say, based on the moves that we had before, most of the time it's gonna be the average true range, or you're gonna take, you know, volatility, depending. What I've been, the normal move historically. And you know, if, if let's say a stock has been moving on a monthly basis, 99% of the time, 10%. And you want, and you tell me, okay, I'm gonna be buying at 100, and in, in two months' time, it's gonna be 150. Either you're completely drunk, or you get a huge catalyst that is that is making the move two to three times more than expected. Okay. And and it's about when you're trading when you're portfolio managing is you are playing with the odds, okay? So in a sense, you know, what are the odds that the wire card is gonna happen? Okay, not that many, but when it happens, you lose everything, okay? So that means when you see a red flag of a short seller, instead of having a 1% chance or a 0.1% chance, it increased to 10 to 20%. And then when you get a second red flag from FT and those guys are good, you say, oh, my chances are goes to 50%, okay? And you play with the odds. Uh, when you start up trading, do you worry about monthly performance? When I started, I didn't give a shit about, about uh, uh, my track record. I, I had absolutely no idea what it was. I was just so excited. I remember putting my huge position, my first position. I, I still remember it. I was just like, I put the position, I said it again and again. I bought something, I think it was a 34, the stock was called Elog, it was a software company. And literally two minutes later, I sold it three or 5% above because there was a bid offer. Okay, at that time the market was very well. And I remember I was so excited. I was, you know, the monthly performance is for later. It's when you start to think, okay, I'm gonna raise money. What about the job, what about, um, yes, you, at one stage you, 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 you have to think, but, before all those questions, you need, to, you need to have a process, you need to have a risk management. So people are just starting the other way around. They say, oh, I want to be making 30% because you know these guys have been making 20%. So 
I find it funny when people is talking about his sharp ratio and he has been trading for five days. Okay, that's completely pointless. You don't have to be looking at those things. Um, you mentioned you mentioned do not force the trade. How do you keep patient and animational animational know where, and when to take profits? Again, uh, emotions are part of the game. Um, I think what works well for me uh, for putting aside my emotions is when you enter the trade, first thing that you, you need to have always is a hard stop loss, okay? So each time I enter a trade and I say, I'll see later for the stop loss, first thing first, the trade is gonna be fucked up. If, and normally as I have a stop loss, if you buy something at 100 and you know that your stop loss is at 95, the only, the best way to go away from the emotion, immediately you put your stop order in the machine. So you put your stop order with interactive broker and you say, okay, 95 until it goes, okay? And that way, then you can revisit the stuff. But normally, if you do that over and over, that's going to help you massively. I mean, that helps me putting the stop order in the system because I know that the machine is, uh, 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 doesn't have emotion. So they're going to respect the order. Uh, what is the starting salary if you work at a hedge fund? <laughs> well, I don't know. I re yes, I remember my first salary. So after four years, when I joined in London, so I was in 2004, uh, I was at 35,000 pounds. Okay. Um, so that was, that was a low salary. And, and obviously in, in 2004, we, the banks were not offering like crazy salaries. And just, it's just after 2008 that they fucked up the whole system because there was no bonus, they were just taking huge salary. So what is, what is the starting salary? If you, if, if you start by thinking, okay, what is my starting salary? This is a bad way of looking at it because what you want to have is making enough money to cover your cost. And then there is the upside, okay? So if you want to think, okay, I'm gonna have 150 because I'm gonna sit, Yes, but maybe you're going to sit for six months or 12 months, but then you're going to be fired. And those people that are going only for the salary, they go from one place to another. But after three to four years, they don't have any high return. Or, you know, they are sales trading, but they are not trading. So it's easy to go for a bank and say, you know, I'm going to be sales trading. I'm going to be trading the flow. You're not trading anything. You just, you don't have any knowledge. You can, anyone can be doing sales trading. Anyone can be doing the flow. If you want to be working for hedge fund or trading, they'll be looking at your track and they'll be, if you're not making money, you're out. Um, what is? Uh, would you say it's very hard to find people who will support you as people are very selfish and competitive these days? Look, I'm, I'm I agree to disagree here, you know, after mentoring 70 people, 70 persons, sorry, I realized that, you know, 95% plus of them were really nice people and happy to share. And I think they were, what you have is in, in the retail trading world, people are extremely frustrated. If you come to me, that means you, you, you pass the, uh, the time of bullshit. You know that bullshit is not going to make you any money. Okay, so you come to me. So maybe you lost money before, and I'm sorry to tell you. But I think you will be surprised to see how many people are happy to share. Okay, what is the struggle? And here we come back into building a community, which I will be happy to have. But here I need help. And, and if people are happy to help me, I think there is something to do. But you need to understand that your knowledge is at a different place than someone who started three years ago or five years ago. And, and, and really the hard part is to put everyone on the same page. So sometimes during the webinars when I'm explaining something, some people will say, oh, it's basic, it's boring. We've seen that over and over. And some people will discover. And it is, it is hard to make something where you talk, where you manage to explain the things clearly to everyone. And really when I built the four by four, I try to do something from the beginner to the experienced person, okay? And, um, so if you, coming back to your question, uh, uh, selfish and competitive, competition is part of the game. So if you want to work in this industry, it's gonna be extremely competitive. 
I give you the example again, and I gave it uh, many, many times. For 10 years in the trading room, at five o'clock UK time, we all the traders had the same email saying uh, uh, the PNL for each trader. So if you were making 10,000 and someone was making 30,000, you were upset. If you were losing 50,000 and were bottom, you, everyone was looking at you. It, extremely competitive. If you're working for a hedge fund, you're always competing to have the best returns because otherwise the money is going to go away. In terms of, of being selfish, if you ask me in the trading room, traders are very selfish. So they are, they are selfish and they are very... Um, we have to understand that in the trading room, you only get experienced traders. Okay, And I, I, I sat next to superheroes of this world in terms of trading. Okay. Guys that are making money every day, every single day for 10 years, 15 years every day. So that means they have a process, they have a business model. Do they want to share? If you're nice with them, maybe they're gonna share. But otherwise, by definition, if you have something that works really, really well, you know, special situation strategy, are you gonna share like this? No, okay, it takes time. Uh, what do I? What do you mean with a trading room? So a, a trading room is, is, in my own words, is is the prop trading, okay? Where you come and you have 10, 20, 50, 100 traders sitting next to each other with different strategies or no different strategies, and are trading bonds, that are trading stocks, that are trading FX, and that are trading that money from partners or from the banks, okay? Uh, is there a market cap filter on your longs and shorts? Yeah, I mean, four by four, I do two to three billion in the US. Um, Europe, you should be doing one billion probably. Uh, I mean, it's a question of liquidity. It's a question of coverage. Uh, if it's too small, it's gonna be way too volatile. The numbers are gonna be completely unreliable. And I come from the background. When I started, I started with the SBF 80, which is the, the small cap. Uh, in France. Then I moved when I was working for the hedge fund. We were doing a lot of small and mid caps, really um, many, many. Um, but that means the liquidity is, is much harder. Uh, and the, one of the reasons you can do that when you're working for a hedge fund is you have companies, you get CEOs, CFOs, you get uh, uh, managers, you get analysts coming at you and explaining the business. So that means you don't need necessarily to have access to the research on the analysts. You can directly talk into those people. If you do pure trading, um, uh, you, you, you need a bit, you need a hedge some, somewhere. And if I, I trade small and mid, uh, just based on price action, that is, that is harder. Um, would you ever trade FANG stocks on the long side? Yes, I mean, I mean everything is possible, you know, it's, it's uh, even if I do have like um, a bit of a bias, uh, a bearish bias, because I think the, the market is, is a bit um, extended, uh, anything is possible on the long. Um, again, the struggle is, the, the people who are very successful is the people who can uh, put together portfolio management and trading, okay? Being both price action and fundamental balance sheet, everything. That is a skill that takes time. Um, and, and, and naturally some people will be better on, on some things. I, I give you an example. You have mentors, mentees that come to me and naturally they are very good with price action, okay? So recently I had a, a nosy guy uh, he was extremely, extremely good at price action. Okay, extremely, extremely good. And, and so we kept on doing, obviously, the quantitative, qualitative, looking at the IDs. Uh, but really, his skill is price action. Okay. And that means the filtering, he sees things before with the price action. Of the, uh, the price action, the trader will tell you that anyhow, price action is, is leading any fundamental, which is very often true. Okay. Um, uh, would you say it is hard to make money in this market? So anything more than 20% return for this year is crazy in your, in your accounts. Um, I think the really smart guys, you know, were 
the one that make money first. Um, I think one of the skills when you're trading is when you know that the market is not for you, you don't trade. Okay, and, and I remember in 2012, 2013, I was looking at my screens, I was frustrated, frustrated and my boss came and said, patience is a virtue. And I didn't tell him to fuck off, but he was right, okay? Um, and that's the same, you can be, uh, I'm pretty sure, I mean, there are many, many people up 20%, okay, for sure, okay? But there are many, many people as well that are down 40, 50% that cut at the bottom, okay? Um, so what I don't like is, 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 is the bullshit, which is confusing everyone, okay? I'm, 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 I've been in this game for long enough to know that there is shitloads of, of, of bullshit. Um, how do you develop patience in this market? Do you just walk away from the screen? So in 2014, I did, um, I did, uh, I'm gonna tell you that, I did some uh, coaching with a professional uh, coach for traders, only based on emotions, okay? Uh, and, and that was really interesting. The idea was, each time you put a trade, you try to write down your emotions, okay? So, so imagine that you put a position and literally you want to know what you'll be doing next. Me, I think I already said it, when I'm under stress, when I put a position, I probably drink five liters, okay? So, so the first two hours of, of the U European Open, I was literally drinking two to three uh, liters of water meaning I was going to the loo every 10 minutes. And this is my way. I have the ways. I'm drinking and I'm scratching, okay? So that's, I can identify that. I think what is important is to identify what, a, how, how you deal with stress, okay? How do you deal with, if I'm telling you now, your piece of shit, how do you deal with it? You say, oh, it's just joking or is it for real, okay? And, and when I say that, when I say piece of shit, because 99%, of Twitter will feel will tell you that you're a piece of shit, which is just not true. It's just that you you're reading what you want to read. So emotions are part of the game. Okay, I'm I'm I'm, I'm not a machine. I, 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 this is why I don't like quant um, because I think it's too uh, it's too mechanic. Uh, so trading with it, you know, if you know if you have to smoke, smoke. I used to smoke. I stopped. I quit. Uh, if you have to drink water, you drink water. If you have to have like, you know, uh, uh, 10 packs of, 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 of cookies, go for them. But identify those things. And I think as well, you need to, if you enter a position and you say, I think for me, that was the key, is when I understand, when I understood that when I was putting a position at 100 and I said to myself, okay, my target is at 105 and nothing changed. And I changed my target. In reality, you have to accept that the hardest part, and here with the emotions come trading with a plan or planning the trade. The reality, if you do the way I do the long short, there is a part of discretionary and you need to accept that there is new market conditions. And sometimes you're gonna be good at, right, at reading those new market conditions and sometimes you're not gonna be good at reading and the beauty of this job is it is a challenge every single day. So sometimes you're going to be fine. You're going to accept to be wrong. And sometimes it's going to be, it could be depressing. It could be hard. Okay. Um, I, I gave the example 30 minutes ago, you know, on Tuesday, first two hours, I was done on the trade. I fucked up. I did some, some shit trading. Then afterwards, you know, I read the news. That was the news on uh, AstraZeneca. So they come with this bullshit on AstraZeneca, blah, blah, blah. I bought the stock, decent size for the account that I'm managing on small. And I covered, you know, the losses and did more. Okay, so suddenly you go from shit day to good day. Okay, and that's the way, and I end up the day flattish. Uh, and that was a good day because I can, literally I was really down in the morning and I end up flat to, to, flat to up in the afternoon. Again, this is the emotion, the emotion. Uh, what is the Twitter account you mentioned? I don't know which one it was. Um, uh, thoughts on Earth, uh, they are bankrupt, it's over. Um, again, 
this is something that I do a lot hurts. Uh, so this is the car rental business uh, that we do a lot during the mentoring is if you don't understand when you look at the company that there is shitloads of risk on the balance sheet because of credit. If, if you have a company that has, so here we are talking enterprise value. Okay, so if you have a company that has, let's say 20 billion enterprise value, but 15 billion is coming from debt, the risk is not on the equity, the risk is on the debt. Okay, and it hurts, it's over. You can, you can name it the way you want. If you are a shareholder, uh, yes, there is some bonds, and yes, you can tell me two more that I bought that two, and, and you sold that three, and you make fifty percent, maybe. But it doesn't matter, you know. Uh, uh, if you have been playing this ID since thirty or something, you've been losing a lot of money. How many hours does it take to generate an ID? Look, um, I think uh, me, I'm, gener I'm trying to generate IDs every. I think as a trader every single minute. I think there is a massive distortion in my life uh, in terms of idea generation. But um, once you have a process, I want to believe that you know five, ten hours per week you can you can have good idea generation. Okay, I, I, I talked to someone that was last week, and it was very interesting because I was lucky uh, with the mentoring and with this job. Are you talking to, to people from all over the world? And it was someone in, 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 in Greenland. And, um, and we discussed the ID generation and how much time. And, and you know, I know the struggle that it could be to be generating IDs. Read it with the four by four. I think, you know, if you build the infrastructure, because this is core, building the infrastructure, making, making, making the, the ideas coming at you, okay? So it's literally, you build the, 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 the infrastructure and naturally everything is gonna come at you. So if you manage to do that, uh, but that takes time to, to build the infrastructure. I, I give the tools, I help people uh, four by four or mentoring. I think five, 10 hours, sometimes you're gonna have less time or a bit more time. And it really depends as well of what you can do. Would you say GSX is a good short? Uh, Look, if, if, if there are some smart guys that are telling me that GSX is as a problem, okay? I looked at it. I looked at how to do the risk management. And I remember I was in France in, in May and I looked when it was at 35 and I was close to pull the trigger and I said to myself, you know, price action is not really bearish. So I didn't do anything. And, I, and as I did this week, I look now at uh, uh, the option chain. I mean, really to start to be making decent money, two to, not decent money, two to one, you need the stock to go to zero. So yes, if it's Wirecard, it's good. But uh, if, you, if you think about Wirecard, where really people made money, it's on the CDS, okay? So on the credit. But um, regarding the book that I have now and with Interactive Broker, it's gonna be hard to have, uh, it's impossible to have access to CDS. So we need, we need to be, to be realistic. Um, what is the future of long short equity? Uh, very strong future. There is always, there always gonna be money. Um, it's very distorted by 10 years of, of, of market rallying and, and, but long short equity is, is, is a great market. Um, I strongly believe in that. Um, Greg, uh, nice job being up 6.5% this year. So no, up to date now on 5% because <laughs> I can done a bit. Um, but 5, 15% as a retail trader, I think it's, it's realistic. Um, it's very realistic. Um, and I know some of you will, on one end will say, oh, I'm up 50%, it's really, really shit. Uh, yes, okay. But some others are struggling. 5, 15% over and over, if you can do it, I'll be happy for everyone. And if I can, if people can be making five, fifteen percent through my product in the next ten years, I'll be more than happy. Very, very happy. Um, what is your favorite method for setting stops? ATR? No, I got three levels of stops, but uh, three levels of stop, which I explained in four by four and the mentoring. It's 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 not that complicated. Um, how relative are leading indicators like the ASM PMI when money is getting printed out of thin air? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that is why we spend a bit of, of central banks each time. Um, 
yes, everything is distorted. We know that we are in this uh, distorted world. Um, on one hand, we can we can blame everyone, and and if we blame everyone, then we're better off, you know, not trading this market and and, and enjoying the life. But if we are trading it, we need. I mean, central banks are part of the game, okay? And and I'm telling you that I've been squeezed since 2800 uh, from from the from the Fed, okay? Uh, and and in 2016, 2017, I was long vol, I was short the market, and I did zero and a bit and a bit and a bit, uh, uh, and a bit uh, uh, down on, in 2017. So I know I know the frustration, uh, um, but this is part of the game, you know. Is um, um, what is a bad daily move in your account? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, every six months, I mean, when I was actively trading uh, for prop trading, uh, every six months I really had a bad day. Really, you know, you get this bad day when you come and say, uh, which is, uh, and here we go back into, I'm very red because it's very hot here, but um, every, when you're in trading room, you have, so in London, for instance, we were 20 to 30 people, traders, okay. And you have different strategies. And you know that every, almost every single day, there's gonna be someone who's gonna be making very good money or someone who could be suffering big time. And sometimes you're like, the market is for you very quiet and you get someone that is suffering. Or someone, or you're gonna be everyone telling you, okay, let's go to the pub or let's go, you know, have lunch and you're going to be stuck to your screen because you're holding a position that is not going your way okay so uh the, the thing is when it happens is when you get this fuck up time on your risk management okay and that's 99.99 percent the reason why there is a fuck up um A, uh, so when you were learning to trade, what was the most helpful piece of advice you were given? Um, I was extremely lucky when I started. Um, I was extremely lucky because I started in Paris with two uh, born traders. Um, and one, I mean, the, the two were, were excellent. And one was really my mentor in the sense that um, you need you need to have support for someone okay so you know that you're gonna have hiccups that it's a tough job that uh, i was extremely lucky they gave me time um f f from that moment i know that environment is key okay so you can be if, if you get a good environment you're going to be making money okay it's all it, it's for me this is this is what matters and and this is what i'm trying to pass on with my mentees is, is passing, you know, a good, um, a good, uh, a good vibe, a good, you know, good setup. Uh, why you left uh, ITPM? Uh, I think I already answered that question many, many times. Um, what else? Okay, last one. What time is it? Okay, uh, last time. Uh, one, two or three, and then we go. Um, the smartest trader you know what separates him or, or her from anyone else um, the smartest trader is someone who feels the market like i've never seen before and i will never see so it's always someone when i don't see much <laughs> i whatsapp him i call him and and he will tell me many interesting things this is i sat next to him in so when I joined, he was already there and in 2009. And, and he, he has this ability of seeing things before anyone else, okay? Um, that's, that's a skill. Obviously, as a trader, you want to see as many things as possible before anyone. Uh, but he's got this incredible skill of, of being in front of everyone. Um, I've never seen something like this. Uh, this guy is gifted beyond. It's just... Uh, and that doesn't mean he's running a massive boat. That is, is um, my, and my first boss, my first boss was, was just like, um, was extremely smart intellectually and extremely good as a trader, uh, very very good. Um, do you still do mistakes? Oh, yeah, I do mistakes every day. 
every day, every week. Uh, trading is, you're going to be making shitloads of mistakes. Um, the thing is, uh, and again, it's cliche to say that, but if you understand what you are doing correctly or badly, that's going to help you massively. I think here about the mistakes and, and, and the trading psychology is the struggle is sometimes you're going to do the same mistakes over and over and over. Uh, um, and you know that you're going to be doing those mistakes and you're going to do it again. And that's, that's really something <laughs> that sometimes it's, it's human behavior. It's more than, it's more than trading. Uh, are you up or down this year, Mr. Dupont? As I told you, I'm up 5% this year. Not great. I started end of January. It's, it's a bit shit, to be honest, but you know, it, is, it is what it is. Do prop traders get paid based salary? Um, well, I was in London. No, there was not. So it's all on the formula. No. Uh, how did you quit smoking, Grégoire? I'm going through 20 a day with this volatility. Okay, um, I don't know. I was not a big smoker, but um, you should you, you you should quit. It's, it's a good thing. You put a bit of weight first, but that's fine. Um, what else? Okay, last one because I'm I'm boiling. It's too hot here. What is your worst year in terms of performance? That was 2017. I was down three and a half percent. That was shit year. I had enough of trading. Uh, I was I was tired. Um, I got too many. Too many kids <laughs> that was too much um but um yeah so people are your friends when you are doing well and people say fuck you when you're down that splits personality great right? yeah i know i know uh how do you gain this skill last one okay last one because um how do you gain this skill greg where you can feel the market um i think feeling the market is is i, I use this um, analogy is the market is like listening to music okay so there is a reason of of, of the markets and and this rhythm is always going to be changing okay so you need to understand the vibe and 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 sometimes you're going to feel it like crazy so you're going to be dancing in tune and sometimes you're going to be struggling uh, and, and by definition some people would be better than others um that's something that if, if you do price action over and over if you understand the mechanism of the market is going to be helpful last question uh, what did you do wrong in 2017 in 2017, I was, as I told you, I was tired. I was to born. And more importantly, my job is to play the odds. Okay. So when you are working in the trading room, most of the time as a trader, trader works well in high volatility environment. Okay. Or higher volatility environment. I always think about the odds when I look at at a trade so if you look at 2017 for the next session because this is you what you should be looking is at the vix in 2017 the vix in 2017 you don't have one session or maybe one session with the vix above 16 percent the whole year it's at 10 percent so that means me the odds first i was wrong on the direction i'm okay with that you know it's part of the game and i was completely wrong on the volatility which was massively distorted here by the fed and by new players coming from asia and the thing is when i'm wrong because i have a good risk management i'm going to be flat or small down okay and even if it's not great because literally uh, that was a struggle i'm not uh, going to be down more than five percent so uh, uh, why because i have strategies that are going to pay for my mistakes so i'm going to be always actively trading and i'm going to have core positions that could go against me okay so that's that's what i do what i do uh, well and that's hopefully you that has done the four by four and is now doing the mentoring you're learning step by step um 
if if you want, uh, yeah, uh, sure, I, I'll let you know the short sellers and the journalists uh, during the next session uh, to follow the guys to follow. Thank you, everyone. I hope it helps. Um, thank you for those of you who send me an email on on the possible uh, subject to discuss uh, on market uh, psychology and, and and risk management, for instance. Uh, if you have more ideas, please. Uh, send me an email if you get questions about either the 4x4 video series and or the mentoring uh, feel free i'm happy to have calls skype calls with uh, you guys thank you everyone uh, good night and um and talk to you very soon bye bye